Alan floats. This will delight the best of you and disappoint those with a slightly unhealthy animosity towards Alan the lifeboat. But I thought I'd deliver that particular spoiler as it means I can use a drone clip that I couldn't find another spot for. Before we get cracking, it's also worth saying that the initial surge of generous donors and buyers of branded shirts and caps have made these sea trials possible. They weren't cheap, and with all the shore base work either end, took up around a week. For that I am very, very grateful. If we could reignite the support via the links in the description, I can keep growing the ambition of this channel. We're aiming for nothing less than total YouTube domination. We begin, of course, on land. I wanted plenty of extra weight on board, so it was time to really load Alan up. First, the 50 kilo third battery, to be used as the engine crank battery. It needed to head aloft to join its two cousins being used to drive the 24 volt electric system. I've neatened up the battery zone's bilge area with its complement of steel ballast bundles. Finally, and with some relief as the area has eaten up a lot of my time over past months, the battery box could go in. This is a simple ply and glass fibre skin box I made over a year ago, originally for four batteries. It fits snugly, but rests on the ballast bars, so the weight is transferred equally and not against the glass fibre sidewalls. Next, before fueling up the tank, I needed to insert the anti-slosh fuel baffles. Although not cheap, they're a better long-term solution than foam that can degrade over time. I wasn't delighted that they arrived pretty filthy from the manufacturers, so I cleaned each with white spirit. Neither the grime nor little bits of white plastic dust would mix well with my newly installed fuel filters. Naturally, I double-checked the diameters would fit through the fuel tank hatch and tried to push them down as far as I could. I assume that having too few, or having large gaps, somewhat negates their performance. I no longer have fuel transfer pumps, they're on the list of things to rebuy. So instead I fished out the manual backup pump to move the rest of Allen's sustenance into the supply tank. Many of you familiar with Europe's rules about fuel taxation and the recent changes might be confused about the colour of the diesel. Rest assured that the full amount of tax was paid and the slight darkening is due to an additive I've used to help the internals of Allen's power plant. Next came the remainder of the ballast bars, around a couple of hundred more kilos. These will actually go underneath the fuel racking zone's false floor, but for now I plan to plonk them down towards the bow end and strap them down for trials. So far, all the fixed ballast has been towards the stern. After the postponed boat lift for trials a couple of weeks ago, impossible due to a gale force wind that blew through southeast England on exactly the day we needed to launch, we were lucky to get a slot in the schedule. The boatyard is busy at the best of times, can only launch once or twice a day due to the low tides in the muddy creek, and there's been a lot of post-lockdown splurging of boaters wanting to get out on the water. The last time we took Alan out on a very basic float and engine test in episode 3, he had been on a brutal diet and weighed barely over a couple of tonnes. Now, although still at a third of the rated lifeboat weight capacity, Alan is about double that of before. Still, no particular struggle for the boat lift that can handle 20 tonnes, but for that it needs expert control and manoeuvring around the yard to the launch slipway. We were lifted the night before the launch, as the high tide was early the next day, and none of us were enthusiastic for an extra early morning, and also rain was forecast, something likely to cause delays, but certainly not another cancellation. It gave me the evening to clear out a few bulky items that couldn't be easily strapped down. Here he is, ready for action, like a giant squashed tangerine, still faintly unsure of its mission. The rain held off for the launch itself, but the clouds began to collect soon after we had moored up alongside local expert and now friend Dix Catamaran. The reason why the rain matters a little I'll cover in a moment. As I said, the creek has low tides and is almost entirely a mud flat for part of each day. Alan sat obediently upright on the mud, although I did double check the rudder skeg as it sits a few inches lower than the keel itself. It would be foolhardy to head out inexperienced and solo into an untested single engine boat amongst busy cargo shipping lanes. Here's the man himself, without whom trials would be impossible. Dick, who I introduced in the ballast episode, has been most generous with his time. I thought we'd quickly discuss the amazing, the amazing weather. It's exactly yes. what we ordered, isn't it? Well, we've had, um, I think, probably eight to nine days of beautiful sunshine. <laughs> Alex picks the day. 
we were deferred because of bad weather which was not very much fun uh, real bad weather we wouldn't defer it otherwise but now of course we've had um, I said it would rain at 9 and yachtsmen don't know much but it started to rain at 9 and it's now 12 all the rain usually assigned for a month came down on this one day naturally the week before was clear and sunny as was the week's forecast ahead this wouldn't be much of a gripe, except for the fact that I had set aside that afternoon and the hours of low tide to complete the first coat paint job around the driving console. There's still a ton of second coating and black detail and edge work to do, but I wanted the main sections complete. Alas, Alan was to venture out to sea only partly robed. Up in the morning for our two day sea trials. Uh, Dick and I are about to go down below and uh, organize a bit of a uh, fuel economy test. So we'll use the uh, use the resistance of the water that we're now in. The, uh, the tide's now come back up, so Alan is once again floating. And we can see at different revs, uh, when there's a resistance against water, what sort of fuel economy we're getting, because I want to find out a sweet spot where we're burning the least diesel to give us our five, six knot uh, maximum speed or uh, optimum speed. Anyhow, it's wet, rainy, um, nothing seems to be leaking particularly badly, which is good news. Uh, and we're just looking forward to getting out on the water tomorrow. We've got Dick hard at work. Oh, we're not filming, are we? We are. I'm going to stop swearing about Velcro. <laughs> the plan was to run the engine via a secondary supply route I've plumbed in for emergencies, like if contaminated fuel renders a filter inoperable. It would be fed by this 10-litre fuel container. Weighing the tank could offer a very accurate idea of what was being burned and how much diesel was being returned from the engine. I've not connected up the tachometer yet, but the handheld laser rev meter was perfect once fired through the front of the engine cowling. It reads a little reflective piece of tape I stuck on the flywheel, and so can calculate the revs per minute accurately. Be careful there's no remnants of tape or white paint elsewhere on the area targeted by the laser, or you'll end up double or triple the correct numbers. At various revolution gradations on the engine, we'd record the fuel consumed over a set time period, all the way up from idle. The engine wasn't out of gear, as this would give low readings, so having checked Alan was securely moored and afloat in enough water, we engaged the propeller. This still won't be perfect, as a moving vessel will lessen the load compared to a stationary one having to move the water past it, but useful nonetheless. All we had otherwise was a questionable set of graphs supplied by the manufacturer. The results were clear. Alan idles at around 900 revs, drinking around 1.8 litres of diesel per hour. This doesn't change dramatically once in gear at low revs of 1200 or so. As the turbo begins to do its work, fuel economy improves towards a sweet spot at 1900 revs. Here, there's plenty of power to get Alan to his cruising speed, but only 1.7 litres of fuel are used per hour, less than half a gallon. Beyond that, it all begins to fall apart, and once approaching 3000 revs, the engine was burning half again as much fuel on top. All you get in return is heat, noise and churned up water. Excitement over, we did have some final pre-trials checks. Firstly, to see if any leaks had appeared throughout the months of work ashore. So we found a little initial leak, which we think is coming from one of the cooling hoses, which has uh, not been adequately maintained or sealed. Maybe the, the hose is getting a bit old as well. Um, but I think for the meantime, we're just going to use some homes. There we are, well done Dick. <laughs> and using the, uh, the the emergency tiller as a tool. If we just get it underneath that black, yeah. remember it's there, but get it underneath yeah. that. That means that we won't have any water sloshing forward. It should go forward. Out. Yeah. And it's already picked up what's down there. Yeah. We, is it, can you see Alex, whether it's underneath the, this black pipe? It's gotta be under that. Uh, it is, yes. Yeah? Yeah, it is. That'll pick it up. Perfect. In the cabin, there'd been a major tidy up from the workshop mode to seagoing mode. You'll see lots of things taped into place to see if I'm happy enough to locate them there permanently. This included safety gear, forkhorn, and so on. Then, naturally, many, many straps. Lifeboats roll plenty as we know, so there'd be no point claiming ignorance once everything falls off the racking and smashes in a heap. Evening came as I completed final chores and loaded Alan up with a mighty two days of supplies. The rain continued on its own cheerful way throughout, but by morning, I was able to eat a pastry on deck without it getting wet. In truth, three pastries. I like pastries.
We did have one little gremlin last night when we were doing our fuel economy tests and it was down here that I think the problem is. The engine was cranking absolutely fine to begin with and then just randomly decided not to start. Um, and we thought that maybe there was a problem with the crank isolator switch, uh, which I'm not sure is the case because we've now shorted that to take it out of the equation and it seems to still be an intermittent problem. Then I moved some of the cables, uh, the loom and the, um, uh, the crank cables out of the way here and I don't know why or how but it seems to have solved the problem. So what I've done is cable tied them in a particular position which seems to work and will run on that basis but I'm going to obviously have to investigate what's gone on there because it may well be there might be a slightly loose connection somewhere something not done up properly but I've been pretty careful when doing up all the bolts and everything should be fine as you can hear it was fine Dick took the wheel so I could quickly zoom around the boat from bow to stern as we released the springs and bow and stern lines from the mooring the creek that leads from the yard and out into the Thames estuary and thereafter open sea has unforgiving tides as I said People regularly ground either side of the narrow channel, despite the route being well marked with buoys. This gentle introduction to the trials also saw the last of the clouds set about breaking up, and so returning us to our consistent run of good early summer English weather. This was something of a mixed blessing. Whilst we didn't want the storm of a fortnight before, benign flat calm wouldn't make for much of a sea trial either. That, and I don't do well in temperatures over 25 degrees Celsius. We were doing 5 or 6 knots, which is both Alan's cruising and maximum speed. It feels sprightly when alone, but Alan's pride was dented somewhat as these jokers casually steam past us. What did become clear almost immediately was that we'd have to rely on the wash from the large ships, and not the wrath of nature to provide waves for stability and roll testing. Regardless, Dick and I set a cautious initial course to the south and towards a series of river mouths and creeks. Alan, and particularly his engine, hasn't ever had a prolonged run at sea, so if there was to be a teething issue, best to have it near to shore. There wasn't a lot of giant shipping storming its way in and out of London's ports yet anyhow, so we enjoyed the fast improving weather. Dick even managed to set up his mini galley on the stern. He doesn't operate without regular mugs of tea, and I had not yet installed the diesel-fired hob for boiling water. I also had a quick peek at the engine, which upon inspection via the rear hatch, I confirmed was still there and the appropriate bits were still spinning around. The engine cowling structure is mostly finished and I recognise I've glossed over this. I'll tag an update on to a later episode so you can relax on that count. I've never anchored Alan before. To be honest, anchoring wasn't something we'd anticipated much or even at all on Alan's original expedition itinerary so it's something of an afterthought. I've accepted now that I'll need to install a proper mount and chain conduit pipe in the coming months. Under Dick's instruction, we anchored without much in the way of fuss. This isn't a particular surprise, as the creek we found for lunch was even more like a flat calm lake than the main channels. It also let me fly the drone over water for the first time. This I've found is far more effective than double, quadruple, mega cappuccino espressos, or whatever it is you lot drink, for getting the heart pounding and demanding full attention. Weighing anchor required a hoist, so Dick employed me into the roll, and the risk of dinking the new paint job has definitely promoted an anchor assembly and all the associated gubbins up the planned to-do list. Alan is likely to do a little more coastal work than originally planned, so it will be worthwhile. We carried on putting more hours through the engine, looking for small issues and getting a feel for the handling. Let's go for a bit of an adventure down the bow whilst Dick is taking the wheel. Now I'll just spin you around. There we go. So you can see um, the difference in the two different uh, paint jobs there. But I'll see if I can point us a little bit further forward. Okay, over there. Dick was initially dubious about the high driving position, but before long became rather fond of it, in calm conditions at least. I have to admit, it would have been a little more useful if we had ended up with some slightly bigger waves than this, but we can't really complain. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. Uh, yeah, we were complaining about massive winds and rain and everything a few weeks ago <laughs> and now we could do with a little bit more wave because Alan's not really being uh, stretched too much in this. Although when there's a bit of a, a bow wave, or actually a, particularly a stern wave from one of the big ships coming through the shipping channels, we do get a bit of a roll on. Still, the large shipping was staying stubbornly alongside. We could monitor the VTS radio channels, but still there was all sorts of jabbering instead of confirmation that thousands of tons of ship were to generate an artificial wave machine especially for us. We did greet Alan's cousin though, hung on the stern of the LPG tanker, 
at a most undignified angle. I also wanted to check out the prop and rudder. Both of these have only a temporary stay of execution, as they might give Alan a boost if upgraded for a four blade prop and larger rudder. It's hard to work out with all the GoPro generated turbulence whether we have any issues with future cavitation. Regardless, it's spinning, so that's a positive. We pulled up alongside that evening in a small creek, and some poor family ended up with us moored right next door, blocking the evening sun. On deck, I discovered the first small problem that threatened something approaching jeopardy. One of the railing clamps was slightly loose, and it crept back, damaging some of the wiring conduit. I bashed it back into place and retightened with an Allen key. I wanted to avoid having to through bolt all these joints, but perhaps it's best to. We took stock from the first, and it has to be said, alarmingly leisurely day, and mused ideas. I wrote with a marker in various spots where it became clear more handholds would be useful, especially in rougher seas. No, not that sort of bar. Alan's far too humorless to be a booze cruiser. Happy boat day to you. Happy boat day to you. Happy boat day, dear Alan. Happy boat day to you. <laughs> What a cake. Whilst there was a requirement for tea to accompany Dick's cake, he did have some more initial feedback. I think it's been fantastic, really. Far more comfortable than I assumed. We have flat calm, sunshine, and we could probably done with some sea, and we should have done with some water, but um, impressed with the steering, which I thought would be all over the place. We slept aboard Allen overnight, albeit with makeshift camping mats and so on, as I haven't installed the sleeping platforms yet. Some of us better than others, but I did enjoy the sense that Alan's insulated stern section can broadly resemble the inside of a 1960s space module. I'm no nostalgist, but it's not the worst aesthetic. Morning all, ready for another day of trials. The weather is absolutely beautiful once again, unlike me. All space inside Allen is going to have to be multi-use. Working, sleeping, relaxing, planning, dressing, cooking, cleaning. But on to day two. Rather like yesterday, we were hoping for some waves so that we can actually see how Alan does against currents, against tides, and uh, how he manages a little bit of chop. But as you can see behind me, I don't think we're going to get any of that today. We'll have to just go chasing some ships to get some, some wake. What you can't necessarily see over there is that that uh, speed limit over there says six miles an hour. And it's possible that we are now doing 6.2 knots. We're speeding in Allen. Aside from scandalously breaking the speed limit, I won't lie, if anything, the conditions seem depressingly calmer than the day before. The frustration of wanting a bit of a squall, having lost sea trial days a fortnight before due to high winds, channeled a sort of frustrated tunnel of irony. We killed time messing around going backwards. Dick had a test for me. That boy out there. The challenge, if you've not worked it out already, was to back up, into a tide, and with a light but changeable wind, to a boy in a boat that was reluctant to go astern. This was my one go, and frankly it went pretty well. Little corrections, careful and often, an awareness that we had steering to starboard and not to port, meant I could judge it okay. Alex, give yourself a prize, put a gold star on the chart, alright? <laughs> it was very well done. It was nearly as good as I wanted, but not quite. Right, now my job is not to crash into this yacht. Right, Dick and I were fed up of messing around in the sheltered waters of the inner estuary. Although we had resigned ourselves to the fact that the forecast of a few hours of wind was lies, all lies, into the shipping lanes it was, and I wanted to go and see a special Thames estuary landmark, or sea mark, or estuary mark I suppose. Still, the waves stayed calm. Often, when we received some wash from a large ship further afield, there wasn't time to grab the camera and record the momentous yet hazardous ordeal of Alan lolloping back and forth a little. This is currently my preferred helming position. 
will not be possible when we actually get out to sea or in any kind of adverse weather, but right now I'm quite enjoying uh, standing up top commanding Alan. The shallow waters did help the waves grow in size. Ballast so far is modest, but even with tons and tons, the boat won't resist wave roll entirely. Perhaps that's something we simply need to learn to live with. Another large ship loomed up from behind, with a bow wave the size of a small house. Alas, although we were delighted that again they carried one of Alan's many cousins aboard, this one named Benjamin, the wave was more of a bump by the time we got it. Benjamin could only look on as Alan was out here, running free, living his best life. Soon our quarry hove into view. Hardly much of a secret, these Second World War installations are known as the Red Sand Forts. They're a good illustration of how shallow much of the Thames estuary is, only crisscrossed with a, with a couple of deep water shipping channels. The forts, and another cluster nearby, are sat robustly on the flats just beneath the water surface at low tide. You can zoom off and watch other YouTube videos specifically about their history, the pirate radio people and all that excitement, but not until you've finished looking at Alan. I will admit I encountered something of an elevated heart rate as I flew my drone again, this time off from the shore and not in a windless creek. The forts did need a little bit of further investigation, although I didn't have the guts to fly through the windows inside the forts. Pleased that I had indeed confirmed the presence and location of large concrete and steel structures that have been in place for much of a century, we could concentrate on the main attraction once again, Alan. And then we could leave the large rusty thingies behind and go searching for more waves. It would take a few hours to head north and then west back towards our home creek, and these, whilst we can't say truly offshore, were far enough off the coast not to benefit from direct protection of land. It was also a good steady period during which to take some temperature readings in the engine bay. The insulated interior of the cowling was holding up well, although I'm considering an additional sound absorbing mat to go over it all for long passages. The header tank for the coolant was about 70 to 80 degrees. The engine head cover no more than 70, stern gland a pleasing 55, and the turbo also stable at 120 degrees Celsius. The exhaust was 90 degrees at the start, and down to 35 before exiting the boat. The lagging, of course, not the exhaust pipe itself. I had left the secondary fuel line temporarily in place, but I want to plumb this in properly so I have an option to quickly move fuel supply to a small movable tank using the L-port valve in the event that fuel contamination completely shuts down my pre-filter and everything upstream of it. It's simpler than a true dual tank system and superior to dual filters on a single supply line as these could just get re-clogged from a tank with bad fuel contained within. Here's Alan bobbing around with the engine at idle, because I like the clouds. Little more. That's enough. By the way, you can't have this t-shirt. It was one of the prototypes I had made before deciding on Alan's merch offering. I didn't really like it. Although, if you want to buy Alan a new AIS unit, then you can have it. I'll even wash it first. One of a kind. A shrewd investment. Aside from the waves from ships, this is about as big as the sea got. It's not massively different to what you get in calm or moderate seas around sea ice that attenuates wave height. The period is short, as the seas are shallow, and this did exacerbate Alan's tendency to roll a little. Longer waves, even if taller, would have been more comfortable. All that was left was to hold station a little around where the estuary met the creek entrance, as the tide wasn't high enough yet. We'd ended up a little ahead of schedule as we had benefited from the tide heading west, so it made six or seven knots. Since these trials were in early June, the days are nearly as long as they ever get in England. It doesn't get dark until around 10 p.m. and we were still a little bit early. Dick kept himself busy. Some ex expert rope work skills here. Goes down. One of our ropes was not in very good nick, so we're doing a little bit of well, repair work here. Temporary splice before we do a proper splice. Excellent. Just so we can get onto the boat. And so what we've actually decided to do is just hold on for an hour or so before the tide floods better. Uh, so we've moored up and it means that we can then not ground as we head. It was quite useful to run Alan a little into the evening. Aside from the basics like ensuring the navigation lights did their job, I wanted to get a sense of the visual signature the boat made from a distance and if in practice the close range floodlights were positioned well. With all this switched on, the electrics were only still pulling a modest current. This was a testament to efficient LED lighting, but also running the system at 24 volts and not 12. It means you can get away with smaller gauge wiring 
And when actually using energy demanding equipment like an electric chainsaw, it stresses the batteries less. Maneuvering Alan when going ahead is easy. The steering had proved responsive yet gradual. Whether the mixture of nozzle and rudder extension around the prop, and indeed the prop itself, is to stay long term is a matter for debate. Alan is not earmarked to take on enormous seas with the impact of dropping down giant waves. The final approach to Alan's mooring really was touch and go in terms of water depth, and once or twice we felt a touch of mud on the keel, but we weren't let down. It's proper Essex Creek crawling, it's called. The last of the mud there on the left now. Mm. Naturally, Dick and I wanted to get our thoughts on film before disembarking and waiting for the lift out the next day. This is Dick and Alex about to appraise Alan. Indeed. How do you reckon it went? Better than expected um, is the simple answer because um, I've never been on a lifeboat. I don't want to be on a lifeboat ever um, other than this exercise because I think one wouldn't know what to expect from the hull form. Mm. Um, That's and very performance. unusual. Yeah. Very peculiar and um, pleasant surprise. Mm. I think it was, even though we didn't end up with some really tough conditions, we didn't get much beyond a light sea state, we still found that we were positively surprised by what we found. Indeed, I think good turn of speed, uh, stable. Uh, we've got a, what is it, 47 horsepower engine? I think 48. Another. A 48 horsepower. You, All right, pick me up on one horsepower. But you, okay, I don't mind. You've put Alan down a, a whole single horsepower. Shocked. And I've tried to teach him things that are difficult to learn and he has learned them and he's very quick to learn and, well, we, and he, we were and going astern weren't we and that was quite tricky we were going astern and mm. I've always said to people that first thing you do when you buy a new boat you can learn all its manoeuvrability by going to a figure of eight going astern um, Alan doesn't really want to do a figure of eight he sort of does a figure of naught and then he doesn't like the other way so, but that's what you need to know, whether they will go easily both ways. He's slightly belligerent like that, but uh, never mind. Well, you know, <laughs> probably gets it from his owner. <laughs> but, but um, no, he's, he learnt to back up to a static object, whether it be a buoy or a jetty or a pontoon, against wind and tide, and that's a difficult thing to learn. Mm. It's a difficult thing to do. There was extreme, extremely strong tide. Not much wind, mm. but quite honestly, um, it's a very large swan. It's a very large rowing boat. Paddling past on the, <laughs> in the background. It's a very sedate rowing boat. Evening. <laughs> and, in the wrong side. and we didn't sink. We, we didn't sink. I don't believe we fought or argued. We're both just far too nice. <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> I could hand over the responsibility for the lift out to the boatyard team, although Dick had done a sterling job of placing Alan into the boat lift's straps, needing to keep the boat perpendicular to a fast moving tide and slotting into a narrow target. Finally, avoiding Alan striking one of those yellow steel structures, as I do suspect Alan would have ended up worse off. I'm absolutely certain that there will be, and I of course welcome, feedback, ideas, indignations, and pure unadulterated outrage in the comment section. Here are my main takeaways, in particular those that will help tune my future projects and works plan for Alan. He won't be on an expedition this coming winter, so there is time. The rolling was high frequency and not what I call good. A mixture of tolerance and more ballast is needed, and even lower down. The engine is excellent, smooth running, and efficient for its type. I even managed a few minutes to tidy up around the shore mooring and repaint the cradle whilst the yard team had lunch. Alan sits high in the water still, but once loaded up with fuel and supplies, this will improve. So far, he settles well and without listing, or sitting too low at the bow or stern whilst underway. He deals well with waves directly impacting the bow. Beyond that, there are a myriad other tweaks, improvements and additions to work on. You bunch have a lot to look forward to. It would be enormously appreciated if you could join the team by either making a modest but regular contribution to Alan's restoration and future travels, by adorning yourself in truly spectacular t-shirts and caps, and also by getting up to date with my past Arctic travels through my books. These final few words of mine naturally will be heard by few, as you'll all, already, have clicked via the description onto Alan's merch and donations page. 
Good on you all, and thanks for the patience as I got this video ready. Bye.